friends, Uncle Marv here with another episode of the IT Business Podcast presented by our good friends over at NetAlly. This is our Wednesday live show. I am back. I took off last week as a hiatus, needed a little bit of rest because the weekend before I had to move one of my clients. The move itself wasn't very far. They only moved about a mile and a half down the road, but there's a whole bunch of computers, a whole bunch of stuff I had to do with Windstream, AT&T, Comcast, and the office location is about an hour and a half from my location. So traveling up there, we actually had to spend the night because we went up Friday afternoon to break down everything, set up the internet at the new location, pack everything up, had to rent a U-Haul on Saturday, move the client, uh, had to go back on Sunday, clear out the old space, and, of course, the week of aftercare as, for some reason, things didn't work after we moved them from the old location to the new location. So that's what happened last week. And for you regular people that are now addicted to Wednesday night, as Keith said, left some of them wandering aimlessly on a Wednesday night with nothing to do. Keith, I don't really believe that because you probably spent the week – with our good friend uh, on the other show, the All Things MSP with Eric. I'm sure he keeps you entertained, but glad that you are back and glad that we are back. I've got some great announcements coming up later, but tonight uh, we're going to get right into the show. I have with me Jeff Bishop, the Chief Product Officer at ConnectWise. They had a couple of big announcements uh, recently, and I wanted to have somebody come on and chat about that. So let me bring on Jeff and get right into it. Jeff, how are you, sir? Doing well. Thanks for uh, having me on the show tonight. Well, thank you for agreeing to come on. I know that you're busy, but thank you uh, for that. So uh, you are the chief product officer there at uh, ConnectWise, and uh, it's been busy, a busy time for you guys. <laughs> it has. Yeah, yeah I, I'm I run the gambit on titles. I think uh, currently, I think my title actually is GM now, an EVP or something. But uh, you know, wait till tomorrow to be something different. So we'll see. But well, okay. Um, so if you do, if you do a Google search on you, you've got I know, I know. executive vice president and general manager of yeah. Unified Monitoring and Management and the AZI, AZO platform at ConnectWise. Does that sound yeah, even a mouthful, close? It? It's a mouthful. <laughs> it is. It is. But. Um, all right, so I guess uh, a good place to start, uh, we should probably start with uh, Automation Nation because that's uh, the last big event and that's where a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about was announced. So for people that don't know what that is, give us a quick recap of, of what that is. Well, um, Automation Nation was one of the events that we had prior to COVID. Um, we had two primary events back then. Uh, one that was very PSA and business centric and one that was very automation. And back, if everybody remembers the name Lab Tech, uh, Lab Tech and Automate, that's that's where we'd focus on automation and, and, and bring all the, the people in who uh, have a, a passion around automation, scripting, robotics, uh, auto, you know, workflows, automation, all that kind of great stuff. So we would we would have the two separate events uh, going into COVID. We sort we we kind of changed things up a little bit and we started doing a cybersecurity event and we just couldn't get uh, get the hotels and get the, uh, the locations back going for the Automation Nation until this year. So um, it was very appropriate timing as we started getting RPA and workflow and a few other automation tools out the door. We're like, look, we need to bring this back and start to uh, you know cater to the audience a, a little bit more. And so Automation Nation was reborn in 2024. We'll, instead of it being a one time a year event, we're going to try to do it quarterly. So we did the first one here in Tampa. We'll do the second one at our uh, just prior to our IT Nation Secure event in June in Orlando, and then uh, we'll we'll get the Q3 and Q4 ones scheduled uh, shortly. All right. So uh, I've been to the IT Nation. Um, I forget which one it is. So Connect is at the no Secure is in November. In, Secure yeah, is in November, and Secure is in June. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the Automation Nation now is that. You know, more geared towards ConnectWise partners because IT Nation's open to everybody. But is Automation Nation? Man, that's a that's a mouthful. 
<laughs> it's, it is, it, yeah, it's, it's a lot to say. Uh, I would say currently it definitely focuses or leans a little bit more into um, our product space or so, uh, RMM, automate, uh, RPAs, workflows, um, sidekick, our AI and hyper automation sort of vision there. But um, the, the goal is as we continue to expand and, and, uh, and uh, you know, become you know, a little bit more attuned with the needs of our partners, we'll, we'll start to open things up and consider other automation uh, products and, and services as well in, in the go forward future. All right. Now, a lot of these things were kind of hinted at when I was at IT Nation. And I apologize, I'm not in the fold, so I'm not always in the know, but uh, mm-hmm. you, those were kind of hinted at with all, a lot of the AI. Of course, AI is huge right now in our industry. Um, but let's dig in a little bit uh, into RPA. And let's first describe what that is and what that means for ConnectWise. Yeah, we we kind of hung the the brand around the RPA, the Robotic Process Automation um, concept, uh, that seemed to really resonate, and it's what our partners were were kind of talking about as they as they thought about automation in general. Um, our solution that we've taken to market is a little bit more comprehensive in that yes, we have. We have bots. We have, uh, you know, um, in the old days with with the up to even the old days, but in in most people's terminology, you start thinking about bots. You're thinking PowerShell scripts or Python scripts. They're running with their RMM. Uh, they're running against servers or or, or different machines. Um, the, the, a lot of the bots or the, ro- the robotic process automation is is that it's things where you don't need a human in the loop. Uh, you can set these things up. They uh, will perform repetitive tasks as needed. Uh, I love them, you know, kind of think about them a lot about like the macros I used to build out in Excel when I'd load a file in it, just sort of run and everything would get cleaned up for me. Um, and then typically I would always break them somehow and I have to go back and refix them. And, but anyway, that was, that's a lot about the, the, the robotics process part of it. And then what we've also added on top of that is uh, more of the true workflow automation. So those do require sometimes human in the loops where you're executing a workflow based off of, uh, a webhook from an application or some sort of an API that's triggering, or maybe a form that somebody fills out uh, into to, to kick off some larger business process automation that actually may include a, a bot uh, as part of, the, of that process. So um, the, when we say RPA here at ConnectWise, we're talking about that workflow, we're talking about forms, we're talking about the bots, and, and then how all those can kind of come together to um, – create an overall sort of automation and, and time savings for our partners. All right. Now you mentioned sidekick earlier. So uh, mm-hmm. when I see, you know, RPA and sidekick together, part of me thinks, okay, well, they sound awfully similar, but they're two separate products with two separate goals, right? Yeah. Um, sidekick for us is, is sort of that uh, similar to the way like uh, Microsoft has taken Copilot to market. It's an overarching machine learning AI uh, strategy, uh, one that will be taken across all of our pl- products and the platform as we progress. Uh, it's really got its jumping off point uh, uh, with RMM and Automate early on where we started doing um, uh, script editing and creation using, um, using AI. And then at IT Nation Connect, we showed a lot of examples of how it could tie in into the PSA. Uh, things like sentiment analysis on tickets or triaging tickets or uh, summaries of, of uh, or notes for the tickets or even responding uh, to tickets uh, that were coming in. Uh, we then extended that into uh, Microsoft Teams where we we're allowing people to interface with that to ask questions such as tell me about my day or my calendar or uh, help me get information on a ticket or talk to me about the, the most uh, profitable customers I have or Anything that you might want to ask or probe uh, to learn a little bit about what's going on inside of your PSA. And then all of the partners, all of the product lines and services are starting to, to proliferate that out across their different areas. You know, you're seeing uh, some, some areas of like documentation creation. You're seeing uh, where the RMM is starting to look at um, you know, device failures. You're looking at uh, imp- implementing it into the CRM and opportunities and leads aspects of the PSA. So every product, every team here is, is starting to pull AI and, and that'll come under the overall sidekick umbrella. Uh, no different than with RPA. 
as we start to implement uh, AI machine learning into the RPA and the workflow uh, product lines, we'll, we'll start to use it for everything from creating a workflow. You know, maybe you want to, uh, hey, AI, you know, help me figure out, you know, to create a workflow that does X, Y, and Z. And it can start to pull in the pieces or suggest answers. And maybe it gets you 100% of the way, maybe it gets you 50% of the way. But either way, either way, you're it's progressing you along faster than doing everything manually. Um, you can then start to utilize the AI and machine learning to kick things off. So uh, as tickets come in the door or new leads or new opportunities, um, you can imagine where AI can say, hey, I've seen this before. I think you should run this workflow or execute this bot or uh, ex- you know, take this uh, uh, take this AI model and enrich the data and then surface it to the right technician or to the right sales rep based off of who's online today or who has expertise in that area or their territory. So, um, yeah, they certainly go hand in hand. We, we talk about and you'll see it. Uh, Microsoft and Gartner and others are using the term hyper automation where AI and machine learning is coming in to sort of augment and, uh, and help out, you know, us humans and, and the companies. Uh, but then when they need to execute something, uh, they still typically are going to tie into a bot or a workflow or a script or something uh, that is uh, um, taking the intelligence there and then applying it to some sort of real world action. So they'd certainly go hand in hand. And you're seeing lots of great companies throughout the IT and the MSP space start to to really uh, tap into this with some pretty creative ideas. All right. So you answered some of my questions already because I was going to ask <laughs> kind of the specific tools and tasks that solution providers can use, but you've kind of hit the gamut. It's more than, you know, handling tickets and stuff. It's, you know, going into opportunities in your CRM. It's, you know, helping people, you know, map out their day and stuff like that. So that all sounds pretty cool. My question, though, is I know that this says – had to have been a long time in the making. So instead of asking, you know, how it's going to benefit us as service providers, how much has service providers helped you with feedback in terms of letting you know, hey, this is great, add this f- feature, remove this feature, that sort of thing? Uh, it's it's all day, every day. We, we've got a, um, a weekly webinar that we do um, where we engage with partners and we start talking about what we're doing in both sidekick and the hyper automation areas uh, that's progressively gotten you know more and more people since uh, IT nation I, I think the last I think the one they did last week had a few hundred people at it I don't know exactly the number let's call it three or four hundred that showed up and and we're giving feedback and giving us insights um, we each of the different product teams have um, different forms or groups so in our virtual community and some of the other communities around the uh, MSP landscape, where people are giving us feedback. We, we bring in uh, pilot testers. So it, it's all day, every day. I mean, any software company will tell you that uh, we, all, we all have what we think are great ideas, uh, but ultimately it comes down to our partners, our customers telling us uh, how they would implement these and really refi- helping us refine those. Uh, often we'll give them suggestions or kind of say, hey, how about these five things? Uh, but then when we start to offer up the first five, we'll get five more or 10 more on top of that, that we had never even thought of. So yeah, it's, it's progressing very quickly. And I think it's coming from a couple of things. It's coming from just the imagination of, of, of our partners and things that they're seeing real world problems that we don't see every day. Cause we don't, we don't walk into an MSP office or sit down at that desk day in, day out. Uh, and then I think that, again, you, you touch on some of the, the, the great companies around our industry and others that are, uh, constantly in the news talking about what they're doing. And I think uh, everybody's taking some, um, uh, you know, some liberties to, to learn and imagine and, and, and build off of what they're seeing into their ideas uh, within their own respective products and, and industries. All right. So for, for those of us outside of the ConnectWise sphere, in terms of looking at what you're doing, let me first ask the question of, is this driving people to pay more attention to ConnectWise, to partner up and start looking at the tools a lot more? Um, yeah, I, I think the, the – is it getting us more attention? I, I think a lot of MSPs know who ConnectWise is. Um, 
Some some uh, are with us. Some um, are with some of our competitors. I think that the work that we're doing around AI and hyper, hyper automation in general is is kind of showing that we we are trying to be uh, fast, that we are trying to be innovative, that we are trying to uh, progress things along faster than maybe we have in, in the years past. Um, so it, it is, I think, at least from that perspective, getting us uh, a little, you know, some good feedback from our partners. Like, hey, this is what we expect. Uh, we want to see uh, you as a as as a vendor, as a partner that we work with, that you are innovating, you are moving quick, you are responsive, and that we're seeing not stuff that happens twice a year or quarterly or even monthly, but every couple of weeks, you know, starting to see new and, and innovative things hit the hit the ground. So, uh, yeah, I think from that perspective, people are excited that we're we've got this and we're starting to move along pretty quickly with it. All right. Well, I asked that more personal because, I mean, my day job is still to be a solution provider and, you know, I'm with a competitor and yeah. I'm watching across the way to see what you guys are doing. And, you know, I'm on the periphery, you know, <laughs> Sean's got me tied into the pitch it thing. So that's, okay. <laughs> that's where I'm at there. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, Sean's great. Yeah, look, every, every product, every, every platform, every solution provider out there has, has something that they do really well and things that they don't. And, uh, it's our jobs um, to to try to improve in those areas that we that we're not performing well and then make them better and hopefully uh, uh, we we maintain our partner base we make them happy and then hopefully we win some some net new people over because of some of the cool things we're doing and I think uh, RPA and, and Sidekick are certainly some of those cool things we're doing uh, along with ASIO and, and some of the uh, the new innovation we're doing in cybersecurity as well. All right, let me just go back a little bit and talk about you before this because now you've been at ConnectWise nine years? Yeah, nine years like two days ago actually. Oh. Uh, I, I think I saw my anniversary. A bunch of you have sent me a, an anniversary like uh, note on LinkedIn. So I, uh, <laughs> I'm assuming it was in the last couple of days. Yeah, yeah. Um, so prior to there, you were – where are we at? Screen Connect? I was, yeah. So yeah. – um, Started out with a small company called Elsinore Technologies back in, gosh, it was probably two thousand and nine. Okay, and uh, they had a they were they had a, an MSP. It was part of their business, and they started up a software uh, division. They had an uh, an ITSM uh, I, ITIL tool that uh, got adopted by some pretty big companies uh, early on, and. The, the, the team was looking at trying to build out net new products from the ground up. Uh, it was a, and when I say team, it was, we're talking about a pretty small group. It was like a couple support guys, two engineers. And, um, and I think the whole company was maybe six employees. We, uh, we, we got in and we started analyzing uh, a couple of different product ideas. And then we, we kind of spun off. Uh, we, we built three or four and, Got a couple of them off the ground in POCs and got feedback, but Screen Connect was one of the very first ones. So kind of uh, myself and one of the engineers sort of split it off initially, started uh, building it up, getting feedback and get it going. And then uh, we start, at that point started shutting down all the the other uh, product lines and uh, and brought the rest of the team in to Screen Connect. And, and sort of the rest was history from there. It, we, from 2009 till 2015, and then uh, as – I think about I think we got it to about eight or nine uh, employees, ten employees at that point, and uh, at that we just realized that we probably couldn't scale this completely on our own. And uh, uh, ConnectWise and came knocking on the door, and we uh, we joined up forces with uh, uh, ConnectWise and Arnie Bellini back then, and Matt Notchab who was running Lab Tech and the, those whole teams, and it was, it's been a great story ever since. Yeah, that's been good. So in your you know, progression there. Did you see yourself uh, at this point now being in charge of all the AI integrations? <laughs> well, it's certainly a, a, a split effort. We we're in a general manager model now. So um, Amir, who runs all of cybersecurity, Jake, who runs all of the BMS, the PSA, and, and the Bright Gauge and CPQ, and then I look after you know the RMMs, uh, Screen Connect, uh, all the ASIO platform, and, and and the RPA, and and then so AI is certainly kind of spread across all three of us. The the initial uh, output was with RMM. 
uh, the PSA uh, with Jake has done a lot there. And now we're all sort of, you know, kind of banding together. I, actually, Jake and I were in here in the office not more than a couple hours ago talking about what's the next steps and what are we going to show at Automation Nation in, uh, in Orlando in, in, gosh, in about two months. Uh, so it's a team effort. Uh, everything that we do here is, you know, somebody has to be responsible for the day to day. But, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's all of us that are responsible. Forward. Right. So I assume that that kind of follows this whole ASIO model. From what I understand, ASIO is it, at first it got presented as this kind of spoken hub wheel thing where everything ties into each other. So is that kind of how everything works? Because everything, I, I, it everything sounds like, forward is. yeah, because yeah. it sounds like, you know, RPA and sidekick or yeah, sidekick would just be a part of everything because it's going to tie into the PSA. It's going to tie into the RMM. It's going to tie into the CRM. I mean, it's, I mean, is that how it's all going to work? Absolutely. I guess the, and I'm, I'm not the most articulate person. There's definitely people who can uh, uh, voice this way better than I can, but ultimately when you, you think about software companies and where a lot of us have evolved and grown over the years, in around 2018, um, uh, going into early 2019, we sat down and said, how do we innovate? How do we grow as a company? And and there was three paths, really. We could just keep doing what we're doing. 20 different products. Everybody has their own dev teams, their own sales teams, their own support teams. Uh, they all have their own back ends, their own databases. And we use APIs and we hook everything together and, and – uh, and hopefully when we make a change here, we don't break 10 things over here. Um, we did probably more than we like. Um, you're constantly syncing data back and forth. And what that usually creates when you're syncing data is you're, you're either duplicating things or you're overriding things. And, and it just, it's a lot of, a lot of repetitive work building out a lot of the same things 20 times across all these products without getting the, the real value to our partners, you know, the MSPs. And none of the engineers like doing that. We don't like building the same thing over and over again and maintaining things and stuff. We'd rather innovate and grow. The The other way to do it was to say, all right, we'll keep them all interconnected as best we can, and then we'll put a nice wrapper on top of it, a, a really pretty UI. You'll log into one spot. It'll feel like one product, one area that you're operating in. But on the back end, they're all sort of interconnected, which still is a lot of technical debt. It's still a lot of maintenance work to keep everything connected um, still slows down that overall innovation. And then the, the next phase, which is a lot of the enterprise companies have done and gone to the, the Amazons and the Microsofts and the HubSpots and the ServiceNows and Salesforces and stuff is to, okay, we're just going to start off with a, almost a blank slate. You know, here's your architecture. Here's your database and data layer. Here's your workflow and automation layer. Here's all the common services. Every software product has a UI. They all have user management and permissions, and they have uh, typically uh, some sort of a ticketing service and a CRM and, and some sort of folder structures. And, and, they, you know, and then they have their domain logic on top. Uh, so what we decided to do was just commonize all those. Instead of having six tickets, we'll have one ticketing service. Instead of having 20 user managements, we'll have one. Uh, and then that allows us to maintain those for all the products to build upon and it allows us to really kind of grow and innovate faster. I provide that background and color. Of the reason we went that direction uh, was because we, we knew it was going to take us some time to get it built up. But as we did, we knew it was going to allow us to really move way faster in, in the go forward. But what it also does for us is it allows us to put AI and that hyper automation at a central layer that every product can take advantage of. Oh, every software product has some type of workflow or automation inside of their systems. Almost everyone. Right. And we did. Um, and everybody was toying with AI for years. It was just not always very good. Uh, it was you know, the generative AI and the large language and what chat GPT and everything has kind of helped kick, kick off over the last 18 months or so has, um, has allowed all of us to, to really expand and grow way faster. Right. So everybody was doing AI, but what it really now is we can put that at the heart of that ASIO platform so that every net new service can tap into AI models, can tap into the automation layer, and they don't have to rebuild it or integrate into it. It's just part of their natural um, design as, as they build out the services. Right. So, yeah, we, 
it gives us a great jumping off point for sure. So I was going to ask you if there was a period of time that kind of either accelerated or jump started this. And, you know, my two time frames are COVID and the introduction of chat GPT to the general public, because it seems as though those were the two events that kind of got us to where we are now. And some people it jump started, some people it accelerated that you said some of those things were already in the works and kind of going and then boom, here we are. Uh, any sense of how that uh, affected ConnectWise and ASIO? Yeah. Um, the, the COVID one was interesting. We we had kicked off. Um, we had, we'd gone through the acquisition and merging of Continuum and ConnectWise in late 2019 and had kicked off the ASIO project uh, in early 2020 before COVID hit. So, um, you know, timing wasn't great for us on that one, okay. <laughs> you know, to, to, to send everybody home and, uh, and try to figure out how to build out a platform from scratch when nobody could visit and see each other. So it slowed us down uh, for sure. But uh, it, it certainly opened up a lot of doors and it allowed us to uh, learn how to work remotely uh, with, and find great talent all over the world which was, was meaningful for us. I think the decision for us to go down the platform was the biggest one, which was right before COVID. COVID certainly changed uh, the way we worked, for sure. Um, and then probably the two big moments for for me lately has been the, re- the release of uh, like about 100 different ASIO services that now all the products are starting to, to integrate with to come together as one true platform as we go through 2024 uh, into 2025. And yes, of course, the, the generative AI, the large language models, um, it's just really exciting. I, around here, we talk about it all the time. It is, it's going to change the game of how everything is done. When we talk about, here's how you've always developed software. Here's how you've always done UX and design. Here's how you should do, here's the best practices. I, I, I think they're all out the window in two or three years. Um, the way we've always done these things is going to change and change dramatically. And we have to quickly be able to evolve and adapt to that. And I, right. I think it's true for software development and I think it's true for the MSPs as well. Like there's that, yes, it's, it's going to change things, but it's going to open up so many new lines of business and opportunities uh, of how MSPs can help SMBs take on and, and also adapt to all this new technology. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, these are, these are the kind of game changing moments in history that um, really define, you know, a generation. So I've got a discussion happening with another future guest about the effect of AI on both solution providers and their clients because yeah. the fear for some is that AI will make it easier for our clients to do a lot of their own stuff. If they can go and tap into ChatGPT or something – and, you know, show me how to code this so I don't need my solution provider, one thing. And then, of course, there's people that are saying, well, if we as solution providers get out ahead of this, we can provide those answers and those platforms for them so that they don't have to go looking for it. Um, are you having any of those types of discussions with your partners? <laughs> yeah, almost every day. Almost every day. Um it reminds me still of going back as uh, some of the major OEMs in the world as they've evolved their pricing and their and their partner programs and stuff and and how the MSP saves looked at and said, oh, you know, so many were like, man, this is it, this is this is going to be the end of my business, and others were going, no, this is going to allow me to you know to do this and this and this, and you know, I'm, I'm going to become a a CSP and I'm going to you know an MSP plus and an you know and um, I don't need to keep exchange servers online and pay for that. I'm going to move everything into the cloud and I'm going to start helping them with Azure and, 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 and take on uh, Amazon's you know, new services. And I'm going to help evolve all that and give them new capabilities. So it, it's, I think it's stepping back and, and seeing the opportunities. Uh, yes. Are some of the same things that we're as a space and a channel doing today going to change and maybe become less less valuable in terms of the ROI for the SMBs? Probably. Are they going to get new challenges? Absolutely. I think about, we've got a huge team here of people who, who help us 
integrate our CRMs and our, our backend data bases and our marketing tools and our sales tools. And, and, um, and now we're trying to adapt and adopt to um, different AI tools within our own uh, technology stacks and in our own day to day. We're technologists and, and it's still challenging. Imagine a retail shop or, or a hospital or uh, people who don't have like yours and the rest of the MSP spaces, you know, technology chops and, and just the way you think through problems, they can't do what you can do. So it is, I think, a, an involvement of the lines of business, uh, but it, but I think it's, it's, it's going to happen quickly. And I think it's going to be the MSPs who are keeping an eye on that and talking to their partners and working with their vendors of choice. You know, uh, Marv, you're with a competitor, so you, you should be talking to them about, hey, I need you to do these things for me because here's what I'm hearing from my SMBs. And, and the same for us. We, we have to make sure that we're staying in very tight circles with you and, and MSPs like yourself so that we're not missing the boat and we're giving you the tools that you need to, to make those quick reactions. Well, that was going to be my next point is that, yes, doing that – because a lot of what you're doing is just simply automating the stuff for us. So helping us streamline our operations, become more efficient. Um, but the next step is going to be educating us so that we can educate our clients about the benefits of doing it this way. So I, I, that's kind of where I see things going. Uh, to be interesting. Yeah. I think most of us in the MSP space from a software perspective, um, we, we've all we've operated under like a lot of us worked in MSPs. A lot of us have been part of MSPs. A lot of us we talk and, and, and partner with MSPs on a daily basis. Um, but I think what we also have to do is start to open up and broaden that 360 degree view and start to like what's happening with other software companies outside of our verticals. That's going to influence and impact uh, the SMBs that, that we all support or that you support that we help you, you know, uh, uh, support that's going to create challenges or opportunities for them. And so that, that means really jumping out of just our vertical and thinking more broadly as to what's happening there. And that's the areas that I think we can help with, with partnerships and relationships we have. But a lot of it is stuff that, that you have with your relationships with each of those technicians, each of those companies that we need to be working hand in hand on what you're seeing um, so that uh, we can advance our, our technology to help you with that. All right. As Keith said in the chat there, I think as with all tech, it is our job to keep customers focused on, I'm assuming, their core competency and help them make money. Yep. Uh, We can help them use AI, enhance their business. So uh, that's the chops there. Now, I'm going to go back to another point (laughs) that uh, I think everyone says ASIO, ASIO different. Is (laughs) <laughs> I, th- I think I've asked this before of somebody, and they didn't know. Is there an official pronunciation? There is. There is. It's with a Z. So it's a Z. A- okay. A Z O. Yeah. Um, but I, so look, why not just make it a Z instead of an? I don't look. I, well, the, the, this goes back to uh, the ASIO is actually ties in with a, a genus of owls, so it kind of sticks with the brand and the logo and the company and who we are. And um, but. So, but it is pronounced with the with the Z. The so, Z. yes, it, phonetically, it would probably have been a, a much easier easier path for us if we'd have done it that way. But all right, now we've talked about all the good. So, of course, somebody's got to ask the question. You know, what are some of the uh, challenges, considerations that we need to pay attention to um, as we go down this road? Yeah, um, there's. There's a lot of papers, there's a lot of studies, and I think a lot of really smart people looking into this that I think even 18, 24 months from today, we're going to come back around and we're going to go, yeah, that was cute, but now here's like some of the real problems that we all have to really focus on. But but these are really um, interesting problems that we that weren't, weren't even in our lexicon as typically as technologists in, in this MSP world two years ago, you start talking about bias and hallucinations and, uh, and making sure that if, if an MSP or your in clients are interfacing with tools that were alerting them that this was AI driven, 
So this, you know, there has to be some sort of alerts or identification so that everybody understands, are they dealing with um, data or information or knowledge that has been stored into a documentation service that is being surfaced? Um, you know, Marv, did you write this article? And, and now all of the technicians are, are reading this. They know Marv wrote it. This is the gospel by Marv, right? Or was this generated based off of 10 different articles you've written based off of 15 different support tickets that, it, that the AI engine has seen uh, solved and it's given you uh, what it thinks is the answer, which, you know, that, that answer is based off of the information and the data that is given. So like anything else, um, all of these AI models are as good as the, the initial data sources that they're feeding off of and also as, uh, consistent as the interactions they're getting with uh, the in, in our space, you know, the, the developers or the MSPs or the end clients that are interfacing and, and providing learned behavior as we go. If if everybody keeps clicking and saying, no, this is the wrong answer, even if it was the right answer, it's going to think it's the wrong answer. Right. right? Yep. So these things learn and they become patterns over time. So it does come back to the data sets. So there's things like data privacy, obviously, that needs to come in. Um, everybody wants to take the, the data that they have and build out models to make sure that you have huge, you know, great jumping off points and the answers that are being provided are as accurate as possible. But the same warnings that we all have, have with chat GPT, if you start feeding in like, Hey, tell me how to improve this software code. Well, guess what? That code is now <laughs> uh, part of some model out there in the world that everybody's going to see. So if you start saying, Hey, these, this is my financial numbers for 2023, you know, please tell me how to improve them. Now, you know, potentially the world has access to it. So the data privacy and security there um, has to be balanced with also allowing everybody to be able to take advantage of the technology. So that's probably point number one. Uh, Number two is uh, keeping a close eye on these models as they progress and look for things where they're drifting out from optimal setups. Uh, We've all seen some of the things that have just been really bad uh, where where the way an AI model reacted to people was offensive uh, or just complained wrong, which caused major problems. So it is, it is about, uh, you know, us being software providers that we are keeping a close eye on this and we're putting in the controls to do that. And and again, this isn't even in in most teams lexicon two years ago. So a lot of us are are playing catch up and trying to, you know, move really, really fast to get ahead of this. Uh, so those those are some of the biggest ones that I see today. But the, again, if we were to go pull up a, an article right now from Harvard or, or any of the other uh, you know uh, Fortune magazine, you're going to see 15 things long with all these data, all these here's all the ethical considerations that every company needs to have. But I think making everybody aware where AI is being used. I think making sure that we we, we focus on data privacy and things that aren't getting out that shouldn't. And then making sure that these models stay in control and that they're providing the right answers or as close as possible, but definitely not giving things that are going to be misleading or cause real downstream problems. You're seeing uh, healthcare implement some of this. And what if they were if somebody was suggested a, a resolution to a healthcare problem that was completely wrong? I mean, that's life or death. I mean, right now we're talking about maybe we give them the wrong answer to how to handle a blue screen or a, a reboot problem. But some of these are going to get much beyond that and uh, in their criticality to a business and or a human. Yeah, it will be interesting. And uh, I don't envy the task you have ahead of you to you know, guide us in this. But I'm thankful that uh, there are people doing that and looking out for us and all of that. So now Automation Nation, as we talked about it, am I correct? Is it in June? It is. It's right before our um, uh, IT Nation Secure event in Orlando. So I, I don't remember the exact date off the top of my head, but it's it will be right before the uh, IT Nation Secure. So we have to. Well, uh, let's see here if I date. can quickly Google. It looks like. Um, Got to put the glasses on here. So I should have had that readily available. So, so uh, it looks like June third. In Orlando, Florida, does that sound right? It sounds right. Okay. Yeah, June third through fifth. So yeah, come on in and join us then. Um, the cybersecurity event is always a fun one. You know, 
get about a thousand or so people in the in the in the facility. Everybody coming in and kind of hanging out and, and talking all things cyber and learning learning from uh, each other as well as the, the the vendors that are there. So, but yeah, that, that's that's the big event. All right. Well, I know that I have plans to be at the IT Nation Secure. Uh, I don't know what Lardo has me doing, but I'll be there. <laughs> and uh, well, so- if, if you're if you're hanging out with Sean Lardo. It, there's probably at least a bourbon and a cigar in place somewhere, and then uh, a whole lot of talking to, to, some, to <laughs> yep, everybody. Yep. So. All right, so we shall see everybody there. Of course, my my goal this year is to make many more conferences as long as they're in the state of Florida. I will uh, be doing very little travel. I'll actually talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, so as we wrap up with Jeff here, Jeff, thank you for coming on and chatting about this. And uh, there was a whole press release of – of bullet points that I was going to kind of ask about, but you pretty much hit them all. I think so. Yeah. The, the RPA is just, it keeps evolving. It's just, it's a really fun project. So uh, if you haven't seen it in the last couple of months, there's just a ton of advancements out there. Come join us. You, you can hit one of our webinars in the virtual community uh, or reach out to any member of the team that can walk you through it. But we've got Custom actions now where you can, you can create integrations into just about any product you want. We've got uh, bots being in, introduced into the workflows. We've got custom triggers and forms rolling out over the next, you know, 30 to 60 days. So um, it's moving really, really fast. All right. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, Jeff Bishop, Chief Product Officer, and a very, very long title that we'll put somewhere <laughs> <laughs> at ConnectWise. Jeff, thanks for hanging yeah. out. I like my old Screen Connect title. It was janitor. That was, uh, that was uh, probably the most appropriate. All right. And I'm going to give you a minute to uh, to make your decision. I don't know if you've made it yet, but we're coming up on Florida man or random question. Okay. Well, since I am in Florida, I, I think I have to do the Florida man one. So I'll, I'll give you my, my favorite Florida man story. Okay. All right. Well, before you do that, let me go ahead and give some love to our sponsors. Uh, I have to thank... Net Ally, the presenting sponsor of the IT Business Podcast, empowering IT professionals with innovative network testing tools trusted by the experts. And just so you know, folks, I tell you, I have a go bag of just my Net Ally tools the Etherscope, the Cyberscope, the AirCheck. Uh, I found the power cord to my Link Runner the other day, so that's there. I still have. The link sprinter in my bag, uh, it is a must. I use those tools almost every single day. Our live stream is uh, sponsored by Computers Done Right. Uh, our good friends over in Venice, Florida, reliable IT solutions built on expertise and integrity and trusted by businesses to keep their technology running smoothly day in and day out. And you've probably seen me Drinking from the cup here, our drink slash mug sponsor, Super Ops, revolution IT operations with intelligent automation to streamline your workflows, optimize your performance, and stay ahead of the curve. The future of IT is here. And it is now time for... Our Florida Man or Random Question segment, and that also is sponsored by our friends over at Super Ops. Uh, Jeff, you said you got yourself a Florida Man story. What what yeah. could that be? Well, this one hit my my radar because of the you know it's it's March it's March Madness. Yes, uh, we're all into the basketball. You know, uh, Mar, I don't know if you remember the game uh, Twenty One Basketball. Yeah, uh, it had lots of different names. A knockout or cutthroat or whatever it may have been, but yep. 21. So I, I hear about an individual being arrested in Florida uh, at, for playing 21 in Walmart. And, I, and my initial thought was, oh, they're they're in the back. They're in the back, you know, uh, playing in one of the aisles, and it's probably some uh, Instagram or TikTok person or something else. And, and, it, and it turned out to be, uh, nope, this is a new game of 21 where – you try to see who can get in and out of the store uh, with the most stuff uh, without paying for it and, and get it out to the parking lot and get it into the car the fastest. So a uh, whole new whole new type of 21. And uh, yes, the individual it is. was out in the parking lot explaining the game 
to the arresting officers for better part of five or six minutes. You can find the video online. It was quite uh, like, no, no, this is a fun game. Like just, just laying it all out, talking about how much stuff they stole, or they put it into some random car. It was a, it was a great story. So. It is a great story, and the rest of that story because that was one of the ones I'm, I was going to select. Okay. Um, so the girl's name that got arrested, Amber McCann, uh, was the one that caught, got caught doing it. And as the police were doing their investigation, because she had already gone in with a cart, run out, got stopped. Okay. As they were doing the investigation, she went back into the store to get more. <laughs> uh, you can't make this up. It is Florida. <laughs> so can't uh, make it up. I will have a link to that story because that's that was a good one. That was uh, going to be my story. But this one, uh, I actually had to uh, pick uh, the story actually. So it got dropped today into my feed. Okay. And. Uh, I actually need to uh, to ask for help from my good friend Josh Liberman in Albuquerque, New Mexico, because Florida man is taking his act on the road. So I wanted to say that uh, police said that they stopped a Florida man from taking a 14-year-old Albuquerque boy to a furry convention in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I think the news people were quite beside themselves when they had to issue, you know, utter the words furry convention. So according to the, an arrest warrant, police will charge 33-year-old Conrad Kuvert with child abuse when they take him into custody. They don't have him yet. So I don't know how they stopped him without arresting him already. Uh, but he has faced allegations of being with an underage boy in the past. Uh, the current teenager is back with his mother's and that the arrest warrant was issued uh, after the boy's mother dropped him off at the Guitar Center on Manal Street Wednesday evening. And he planned on walking the short distance home less than two hours later. When the boy didn't come home, his mother tried to find him and ended up calling the police. And then there's a whole bunch of stories there. So I will have a link to that. So there are other Florida man stories in other states. Folks, we are coming. We are coming with the, with the success of the Florida man games. Also, yesterday, the legislature of Florida put on the ballot the opportunity for Florid Floridians to vote for the legalization of marijuana. In the state of Florida. So that is on the ballot for this November. We need 60% of the people in Florida to approve that. And I think when that happens, you're going to have some more Florida man stories. I, I thought it was already legal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Florida, we, it doesn't they matter if it's legal or not. Though. Florida man didn't care about COVID. I mean, that didn't happen. <laughs> nope. Most oh. people think I'm joking when I talk about coming back from North Carolina down here in September and uh, and walking into uh, a restaurant uh, bar and, and they and I so I just came back from North Carolina and I had the mask on and they're like, "What are you wearing a mask for?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Okay, fine, I'll take it off. I'm fine. It was good." Uh, it is fun. Well, Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you, obviously, for also sharing your Florida man story. And uh, I need to give a little shout out to Holly uh, of, of the uh, Ink House for helping put this together. So I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, I requested some stuff and Holly came through. So thank you very much, Holly. Um, Jeff, I'm sure I'm going to see you in Orlando. I'll see you in Orlando. It will be fun. We'll, we'll grab a beer and tell some Florida Man stories. All right. Uh, I do want to also share, folks, that I told you I'm going to be traveling so let me just give you a quick little glimpse of what's going to be happening coming up. Are you guys excited? Are you ready to start beyond? I think folks are really, really excited about what they can do with their customers. 
and how they can help grow their business. It's a massive opportunity for all of you. Cheers to the channel community. That is going to be happening once again. Rob Ray and Pat Zate putting on Pat Zate Beyond. I just secured my ticket, my accommodations, and I'm just waiting to get my airline booked. So I will be in Denver uh, June 9th through the 11th. So if I attend all these things, it's going to be a busy first two weeks of June with IT Nation happening, Automation Nation, Pax 8 Beyond. Uh, Next week, I will be in Orlando for Channel Pro Live. And uh, I'll have a link to that. So if you have not paid uh, attention, April 10th and 11th in Orlando, Florida, events.channelpronetwork.com, two days of that event. And, of course, I got to pimp my sister podcast and friends at MSP Unplugged. TechCon is back on, and that is happening this November as well. They have asked me to come back and help. So I will be there as well. So conference uh, season is upon us. So we will be out there. All right. That's going to do it, folks. Uh, Jeff, once again, thank you for coming on the show. And thank Thank you you. for everyone that joined us here live. You can do that most Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. Of course, we have a lot of audio content coming out as well. If you are not subscribed on any of the podcast apps, head over to itbusinesspodcast.com. Check out the shows there. Pick your app. Shop on Amazon. Support the show. Do all that stuff. And that's going to do it. Next week, I will be live. I just don't know from where. Because if you heard April 10th, that's a Wednesday. So I shall be live from somewhere between Fort Lauderdale and Orlando. But we'll see you then. And until next time, holla.